Hello everybody, welcome again to Citrix Converge 2021. Uh, my name is Jan Tijtgat, I'm a senior architect uh, at CoreLayer in Belgium, and my session will be about the CoreLogic framework for Citrix ADC. Let's jump right in with the agenda for today. First, we'll talk about the history of the framework, where it all started, and how we came to the current version 10.9 of the framework. By looking at the challenges during an ADC project and setting goals for the framework to solve, you should get a feeling for the reason why we developed CoreLogic. Now the why question has been addressed, we can go ahead and explain what CoreLogic can actually do before we move on to a live demo. Finally, we'll have a quick word on the roadmap ahead. In my early career, I tried reusing policies for some applications by using stream maps to implement parts of the content switching configuration. In the summer of 2014, I met my late colleague Rules Schreibers during a Citrix event. We started working together pretty soon and had a first attempt at consolidating configuration styles and policies. Pretty soon, we had to do a big redesign project for a customer, converting hundreds of policies into a solid configuration which would improve supportability, we created the first production version of CoreLogic. We were then selected as a finalist at the Geekspeak contest during Citrix Synergy in 2016, where we also decided to make the framework completely free and open source while effectively moving it into GitHub uh, later on. Since then, we've moved on from version 10.3 to 10.9. Done with the history, let's move on to why we developed the framework. Let's take a look at the challenges we faced during that big redesign project. First of all, we were trying to think about a good architecture for that customer. They were a large company with about 150 brands across 20 countries, which all had a lot of applications for many tenants uh, that needed to be integrated into one another. During that time, the customer was also doing a lot of acquisitions, so we had to talk a lot with their engineers to implement the new applications and to integrate the, the application from the acquisition into their own platform. And as many of you will know, on a Citrix ADC, there are often multiple ways to configure a feature or a request that they were doing. Um, so we had to watch out how we would structure the application or the implementation of the platform as such so that we can support it easily. Moreover, we had to take into account that they didn't only have a production platform. They were really moving from development to testing to acceptance and production. So we had to be able to support all four environments independently of, an, uh, of one another, even if they were running on the same ADC instance. This brings us to the cost of operating the ADC platform. Because of all the acquisitions, there was a lot of onboarding that needed to be done to integrate the new set of applications or the new set of domains into the current working set. So we had to do a lot of change management and that specific change management for that customer required a lot of specialist knowledge because there were content switching virtual servers with hundreds of policies uh, bound to them. And if we didn't watch out where we put the priority of a new policy, we, would, could, we could break a lot of applications running on the same content switching virtual server. It even took us up to two days sometimes to correctly identify the location where we should insert a new policy or a new application. So that was a big factor into developing CoreLogic. But as we saw Citrix ADC as a strategic component of the customer's environment, we were trying to optimize the use of features and capabilities of the platform for 80 to 90% of the use cases they had across a single code base so that we could improve the architecture we could improve uh, supportability and decrease costs uh, while operating the Citrix ADC platform. So what are the goals for the CoreLogic framework? First of all, we want to put an emphasis on standardization. When you have multiple engineers working on one configuration, you basically want all of them to operate in the same way. That also allows you to quickly learn about someone else's configuration when they are absent. A simplified configuration 
also means that it's easier to document and visualize all the moving parts of the configuration and focus on the application specific doc documentation so that we, that we don't have to care about all the repetitive stuff that is going on into one piece of configuration. The requirement that you have to explicitly configure everything into the framework means that you know exactly what traffic is flowing through your Citrix ADC, while it also gives you access control from layer 4 to layer 7. Combine that with advanced debugging capabilities on all the policies, you can get a pretty good picture of what is happening uh, on your Citrix ADC in real time. And last but not least, we want CoreLogic Framework to be compatible with all editions of Citrix ADC and all versions starting with uh, Citrix Netscaler version 9.3. So, what is CoreLogic Framework? Let's dive into the rabbit hole. Let's take a look at the following diagram. We have traffic coming in from the left. It is hitting a content switching virtual server on which a set of policies have been defined to determine which load balancer to use. On that load balancing virtual server, we can have a set of policies which will be um, evaluated before sending traffic through the service groups to the real backend servers. Now, what CoreLogic actually is, it is a predefined set of logic on the content switching virtual server to determine which load balancer is to be used. And it also incorporates IP address controls so that we can have ACLs on the traffic going through the content switching virtual server and through the load balancing virtual servers. So in short, you could basically tell that CoreLogic is a routing framework for applications within Citrix ADC. Now, as I've said before, we wanted to have all the moving parts of the data into a specific set of tables. These tables on a Citrix ADC are string maps. And for those, we have two of them. We have SMCS control, which controls the application flow through a content switching virtual server, basically getting the request, handle it in the content switching virtual server logic and determine which load balancing virtual server we have to use for that request. The second one is the SMIP control, which controls the access zones for a set of content switches and also uh, controls the allow and block lists for content switching virtual servers and for load balancing virtual servers as well. I can hear you thinking, access zones? That's something new on an ADC. Well, yes, in our case, we define two access zones, basically being LAN for networks that are to be considered internal or secure networks and the any zone, which is the default access zone for all applications. All networks which are not explicitly defined as a LAN zone are by default a any zone network. These access zones are used to diversify requests so that we can select another load balancing virtual server for traffic which is coming from a LAN zone compared to traffic which is coming from the any zone. Beside the access zones, we also have IP address controls. They control the allow and block lists to control access to resources based on an IPv4 address or subnet. We support all uh, 32 IPv4 subnets, so we can have granular control over access to a content switching virtual server and a load balancing virtual server at the same time. Now, access zones and IP address controls are pretty nice, but they won't assist you in handling requests and targeting the correct load balancing virtual servers. So for that, we have to distinguish between a couple of things. First of all, for layer four traffic, whether that be TCP or UDP traffic, it's not really that hard. I mean, you get traffic into a certain port and you need to forward that to a specific port on the backend virtual server. There's not much magic to do there, so it's pretty straightforward. However, for layer seven traffic, there's a lot more data that can be evaluated. So we can have a much more granular control on how to evaluate the policies. CoreLogic has five scenarios for content switching based on the FQDN and the URL path. 
notice that the data in the URL query will never be taken into account. So the five scenarios we have are full path, first path element and the second path element, only the first uh, path element, only the FQDN and a wildcarded domain. So how does that translate into a real life example? Well, let's take a look. Right here, we have an example of a HTTP request which can come in to the ADC. We have HTTPS www.netscalerrocks.com forward slash packet engine forward slash internals forward slash documentation dot PHP question mark section equals rewrite. So in the five scenarios that we have for layer seven traffic, we have the following uh, identifiers. So again, full, second, first, FQDN and wild. This might not look like much, but these five scenarios basically cover 80 to 90% of all the traffic decisions that I've had to make in the last 10 years in my Citrix ADC career. So it's quite powerful if you can limit all the decision making to those five scenarios. Okay, cool, you say. Now, if you have those five scenarios, what can I do with it? Well, first of all, you can actually send the traffic to the required load balancing virtual server for that request. That's the basic option. But of course you want to do some special things from sometimes. So what are the scenarios that we support, let's say as a destination for the given request? Well, first of all, we can do a lot of redirects. We can do normal redirects, well, where we define the full redirect where the traffic needs to go. We can do a redirect where we keep the current path of the request, but send it to another FQDN. And we can switch protocol from HTTP to HTTPS and vice versa. Now, of course, nowadays with all traffic requiring to be HTTPS, this is more or less an option which will be uh, used less and less, but still sometimes you need it. And those redirects we can do with a, a set of uh, response codes. Basically, we can do a 301 or a 302 redirect or the newer versions 307 and a 308 redirect, which should be more appropriate for most of the traffic. Besides redirects, we can also decide to deny access to a given resource. We can either drop the request or send a TCP reset, or we can show a page not found or even a blocked page. The page not found, of course, is a 404. The blocked page will give you a 200 OK. Now, there was a lot of mumbo jumbo, a lot of information. So you might be a bit stressed about the ease of use of the CoreLogic framework. So let's head over to a demo so I can show you how easy it is to install and how easy it is to use and configure. All right, let's get started. So right here, I have a new ADC uh, instance deployed with the latest version of 13.1. And as you can see, the VPX is fairly empty. There are no virtual servers, no servers, and there are also no policies whatsoever on the system, except of course for those uh, provided by the installation. So what we need to do first is we need to get over to GitHub, take a look at the installation file for uh, CoreLogic, and go ahead and install it. Right, so I'm going to select all the text, press copy, and then switch to my terminal where I'm already logged on to my ADC and just press paste. And it will install all the policy expressions that need to be installed for CoreLogic to work. So it takes some time, it's about five to 600 lines of code. And as soon as it's done, we are ready to go. Let's hit a quick save config. Now it is done, we can switch to our Visual Studio Code instances where I already copied the creation file for content switching virtual servers. So right here, you can see uh, the complete code to create a new set of uh, content switching virtual servers, which what is what we call a tenant in CoreLogic. It's just a combination or a collection of applications that logically um, belong together or that can benefit from having the same uh, kind of settings uh, and profiles applied to them. So what do we need to do first is to replace a uh, tenant in uppercase and lowercase uh, in all the complete config files so that you can see that the name will be replaced. 
we will also add an entry to the SMIP control to say whether or not the content switching virtual server is a block list or an allowed list. By default, of course, it's a block list so that we can allow all IP addresses to pass through. And uh, we need to change the IP address to a real IP address, of course. So let's go ahead and replace tenant with the correct name. So we'll change it to colors. We'll preserve the casing so that we have to do the, the final replace operation just once, like so. And then we'll change the IP address as well. And we are going to change it to 193.110.255.2. As you can see, all the policies are there. First of all, we are going to check whether or not the content switching virtual server and the load balancing virtual server is added to the IP control. Uh, string map then we're going to check if it's an allow list or a block list and whether or not the IP addresses are on the list or not if that is working fine we will go ahead and run through all the scenarios first for the LAN entries second for the any entries and these policy sets are the same for HTTP and SSL for TCP SSL TCP and UDP traffic Let's select all the text in the file and head back to our terminal. Quick clear. And then we can go ahead and paste the rest of the config in there. Right. Let's do a quick save config again. And then head over to the browser. So you will see in the string maps, the string maps have been added. And we now have a couple of content switching virtual servers. I already prepared a certificate on the appliance. So let me add it as well so that we can get a proper SSL connection to our applications. And now we're good to go. So basically we've installed CoreLogic on the appliance and we've created one tenant for the colors application that we have running in the backend. Let's open up another window and go to the colors.corelayer.eu FQDN. And as you can see, nothing will happen because we haven't configured anything yet. So back to our Visual Studio code, I've prepared another set of data here where we are going to add three backend virtual servers, create some server group for colors, for the color red, for the color green and the color blue. Copy this, head over to the terminal, inject all the load balancers in there. And you might expect, well, we, we have already done some things. Would it work? Well, go again, go to the browser, nothing happens. Of course not, because we have a content switching virtual server and we have a bunch of load balancers, but there's no data in the, in the string maps yet, so we cannot compare what we should do. For CoreLogic to work properly, we first have to add all the load balancing virtual servers to the IP control list, stating that everything is a block list. Of course, the syntax is, is quite easy. You say bind policy string map, SMIP control, the name of your load balancer in lowercase, and then define whether the list is an allow list or a block list. So let's go ahead and do that first for the load balancing virtual servers. Add them to the IP control list. Of course, for the content switching virtual servers, we have already done that in the first step because it's part of the installation procedure for a new tenant. The first step is done. So now let's go ahead and define some application and their components into the string maps. So to add an entry to the CS control string map, you basically add it as the name of the load balancing uh, content switching virtual server. You specify whether the zone is any or LAN, remember the IP access zones, and then you state which request it should handle. As the value of the string map entry, you define which load balancer it, it needs to send the traffic to. And then if it's a redirect virtual server, you can specify the destination. Now, the same as with the IP control string map and the, uh, the S uh, CS control string map, the key 
always needs to be in lowercase because we convert all the expressions into lowercase so that we can uh, have no ambiguity between entries and then the rest should follow the correct casing for the name of the load balancing virtual server. Remember, we have five different um, scenarios that we handle, full, second, first, FQDN, and wild. So first, let's get started with the least specific one, the wildcard. I'm going to add a policy string map entry um, for the wildcard domain, star.corlayer.eu, and send all that traffic into the virtual server colors. Let's see in the terminal, I've added the string map entry. And now let's head over to the browser and see what happens. As you can see in the entry, I've specified the entry to be on the HTTP content switching virtual server, and it should handle any domain I throw at it. Of course, DNS needs to be there. So in the browser, let's retry this connection. And as you can see, I'm going on HTTP to colors.corday.eu and I have all my uh, load balancing on colors. Now, if I go to red.corday.eu, I should still hit the load balancer as we defined the uh, wildcard domain. Back to our Visual Studio code and let's add some other entries. So we are going to add specific cases for the FQDN, for red, colors, and then the same on SSL, colors, red, green, and blue, and send all the traffic to their respective um, load balancing virtual servers. Let's copy that, then head over to the terminal and add the entries to the string map. Now let's have a quick look at what is in the string map already. So for starters, we have the wildcard domain star.color.eu going to colors, red on HTTP goes to PS red, and the colors.corlayer.eu domain on HTTP also goes to the colors load balancing virtual server. Because a full FQDN is uh, more specific than a wildcard domain, red should now go to the red load balancing virtual server and not to the colors. So let's try that out. I'm going back to my browser, and if I refresh the page right now, I should be getting the red page all the time, which is working. So basically, the star.corlayer.eu um, domain is not hit again with the red.corlayer.eu FQDN. If I go to blue, of course, it should go around again. Now, for SSL, we have added the same thing, so let's switch back to HTTPS for blue and we should get the request being responded to. Let's do some cleanup first and clean up the entries for HTTP because we do not, we do not want uh, to have any traffic on HTTP. We want everything to go to SSL. CoreLogic has a feature uh, implemented that if there is no entry to be found on the HTTP content switching virtual server, we move automatically to SSL by sending a redirect command. So let's head over to the terminal remove the entries for HTTP. And if we now do a show run, you will see that all the HTTP entries have gone. Okay, how can we verify it? Well, simple, let's go to the browser and go back to the HTTP or cor colors.corelayer.eu and you will see that we get automatically redirected to HTTPS. There are three other scenarios we haven't talked about. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code and you will see that we are going to add an entry for the full path uh, colors.corelayer.eu forward slash and send that one to the red load balancer. The terminal, add the command. And now we go back to the browser. So if we hit this page, we should now go to red. Why? Because the browser is basically stripping away the forward slash at the end. So basically, when you do this, you are asking for this page. Let's see. We hit enter, we go to red, and we stay on red. 
remember, this was only the entry for a full path ending with a forward slash. If I go one level deeper into the application by going, for example, to first, I will head back to VS Colors because we do not have an entry for first forward slash. We only have one for forward slash. So the string map control will take over again And you will see that for colors, everything which is going to the domain name should go to VS Colors, except if it's ending in the full path with a forward slash, then it should go to red only. Now let's move on to another scenario. Back to Visual Studio Code. And we are going to say that everything which is colors.corelay.eu with first as a first path element should go to green from now on. I'll select, copy into the terminal, like so. I'll take a look. So the domain colors.correlator.eu is going to colors, colors.correlator.eu forward slash is going to red. And if there's colors.correlator.eu slash first, we should go to green onto the browser. This one should now stay on green. And as you can see, it is working. If we go back to the root domain, we are going to red. Now, if I'm going to one level deeper, it will still hit the green virtual server because first is the most specific entry that we made in the string map control, but second or for, uh, second forward slash isn't a full part. It isn't defined yet. So we go back to Visual Studio Code and say that the colors.correlator.eu slash first slash second should go to the virtual server blue onto the terminal. We do a show run. So colors, the domain goes to colors, forward slash goes to red, forward slash first goes to green and forward slash first second goes to blue. And if we now hit this one, we are going to blue. As a final scenario, we'll add the full part of the application on the third level also to the string map control. So back to Visual Studio Code, and there are two lines there that we can still add, which is first slash second slash third forward slash and first second third slash index.php. Let's paste those in the browser as well. And now we will see a full configuration for colors.corelayer.eu. So the domain goes to colors, forward slash goes to red, forward slash first to green, first second goes to blue. But when we hit a full path on third and third slash index.php, we should go back to the normal load balancer. So first of all, let's hit the domain, which triggers the forward slash. Then we go to first, we should go to green. When we add second, we go to blue. But as soon as we hit third, we should go back to the round robin load balancer. So this way you can basically see an application as a combination of modules. For example, in exchange, you have slash OWA, slash ECP, uh, the auto discover uh, endpoint, and you can basically split up the behavior of the load balancer according to each and every subdirectory. Now that we have basic content switching policies under control, we can go ahead and move on to the special load balancing virtual servers provided by CoreLogic. So I'll go back to Visual Studio Code and I can show you on the next page that um, we still have the domains right here. So we're going to override them again just to make sure that everything is clean. And then we'll go on to the block page. So from now on, instead of going, remember in the previous uh, section that we wanted uh, colors.corelayer.eu forward slash going to red, we are now going to say that colors.corelayer.eu forward slash should give me a block page. So I'm going to copy this line 
head over to the terminal like so show run and you will see that colors.corelayer.eu forward slash should now be pointing to the block page if we take a look in the browser to see what that means it means that if we go to the root page of the domain we now get a block page of course this page can be modified to your will if you want to if you want to include a specific layout or, or other data moving on to the next one i'll switch back to visual studio code and we'll see that we want red.corelay.eu to go to the not found page green should go should get a reset and blue should get a silent drop of the package so i'm gonna add these three commands to the terminal as well like so and then let's have a look at what the string map looks like so everything for color first second is still there the domain is going to the uh, virtual server for colors red green and blue should be working but if we hit the root page for red, we should get a not found. For green, we should get a reset. And for blue, we should get a drop. So let's head over to the browser and see what that looks like. So colors, we already discussed. I can do a refresh and we should get the page. Red should give me a page not found. Green should give me a reset. Secure connection failed, you get a reset. And blue should give you a timeout in the end. You'll see it's taking a lot uh, longer. You basically get a reset as well, but in this case, because it is a drop, you just get a silent timeout. On to the redirects, because that's also a powerful feature of CoreLogic. Switching back to the Visual Studio code and head over to the next file, we will prepare some other. Uh, redirects. So here we are going to do a simple redirect when we hit the SSL content switching virtual servers on colors.corelayer.eu slash red. I want to redirect my browser to red.corelayer.eu slash first. I'll copy the line, head over to the terminal, bind it, and then show what is in there. Now, red.corelayer.eu should give me the red load balancer. When we do a redirect from colors.corelayer.eu slash red, it will send us to red.corelayer.eu first. There isn't an entry uh, for that specific part in the string map, so we should just hit this line. So we should get a red page in the browser. So we are going to https.colors.corelayer.eu slash red and we get the red page the next redirect i want to show you is a redirect where we will keep the original part that was in the request before we are sending it to the new load balancer or to the new destination so to speak so we want colors.corelayer.eu slash first slash second slash third to redirect to green.corelayer.eu but we want to keep the full path so we are going to copy this line, add it to the configuration. You will see that it's right there. So now we should get a 302 redirect with a key path to green.correlate.eu slash first slash second slash third. We go to the browser, Let's say colors.correlate.eu slash second slash third and that should go to the green load balancer to end my session i would like to go over some things which are on the roadmap um, as i told you before we have full ipv4 support but ipv6 isn't supported yet because it requires a tremendous amount of uh, code to completely handle all the ipv6 subnets so we are including that. Uh, we will also redesign uh, the control flow, uh, which you saw in the binding of the content switching policies, because we found uh, some design flaws that you would notice when you are binding responder policies 
uh, directly on load balancing virtual servers because they precede the responder policies which are bound to a content switching virtual server. We also want to allow for better response control. So whether you get a drop or a reset, we want to make that more granular. That's it for me. My name is uh, Jan Tijdgat. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me through email or via Twitter. And if you want to take a look at CoreLogic, the link is on the right-hand side. Thank you very much for joining, and I hope to see you next time.